good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm doing this double-handed, so I hope it works. Uh, and and yeah. uh, <laughs> transitioning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, it works. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so in my presentation, I'm going to try to address these three questions. Uh, what is the new resilience paradigm? Uh, what are the implications for all of us engaged in the transport sector? And how best should we respond to the challenge? So what I'm hoping to demonstrate, and I'm coming from a completely different perspective <laughs> from the last speaker, and hopefully that's part of this conference, is that you're going to see lots of different perspectives. Um, so what I'm hoping to demonstrate is that all of our transport schemes and interventions need to address each of the following uh, three criteria if they're going to be truly successful, truly resilient in the full sense. So first of all, our interventions have got to respect the natural limits of the planet. It's the only habitable one that we know. Forget Mars, <laughs> forget the moon. Um, second, the most efficient way of identifying vile options, I'm going to argue, is to actually work backwards from a clear set of objectives and to your potential solutions, not the other way around. We shouldn't let the technology or the marketplace lead us. And thirdly, our interventions need to incorporate agile feedback. So I'm going to propose a unified model called Resilience as a Service, or RAS, uh, for achieving this. And the emphasis here is on urban design uh, applications, because obviously we've got limited time. Okay, so I want to touch on four areas of professional practice, the ones that I believe to be in greatest need of change. They're not in any particular... Oh, it's done it. <laughs> it's done it. Okay. That's it. Must be bouncing off the walls. Um, so no particular order, forecasting, appraisal, innovation, and design. And, and the reason that I chose a maze as my logo, some of you might know this already, um, if you want to know the quickest way through a maze, you start from the middle and work backwards. <laughs> it's a little cheap. OK, so um, if we start with a map of Costa Rica, obviously I've taken away the other countries. <laughs> just for clarity. Um, we're transport professionals, so we're going to focus on the transport networks. But we should never forget that what's actually driving those <laughs> is haywire, isn't it? That's it. What's actually driving those processes is the, the population centers they serve. And obviously, we've got a huge um, a cluster in the center around San Jose. Nearly half the population of Costa Rica is in San Jose. But in turn, um, it's their underlying geography. It's, it's the natural resources beneath that support everything. So I'm not going to labor the point, but obviously climate change is going to keep coming back throughout this conference. This is what is at stake. This is the forecast outcome of climate change with global warming at four degrees Celsius, okay? Maybe I'm being a bit pessimistic here. Um, and you see anything inside that red box, pretty much, except the green bits, will be uninhabitable, <laughs> okay? That's half, half the planet. Um, this is no joke. These kind of scenarios have been around for, for longer than you might think, at least 50 years, but we're still struggling to, to find a response. Currently, we're heading for a net increase of 2, point, 2 to 2.5. Our target's 1.5, but we're still heading for 2 to 2.5 if we carry on at the same rates. And that's going to make life extremely difficult for everyone. So business, business as usual is not an option. Okay, there is no planet B, of course. But there's no um, shortage of proposals for, um, for tackling this, certainly from the energy perspective. Um, here's one. It's from India. just happens to be from India. The important thing here to note is how many sectors are involved. So we're talking about power supply, transport, um, agriculture, education, just for energy. Um, they've all got to work together. We talked about collaboration, but they really must be in sync to have any chance of success. So we need to have a common set of objectives and timescales. We need to plan in an integrated way across all of the sectors. Okay, so the, for the common objectives, I think there is one really strong candidate. That is the planetary boundaries model. I know how many of you have heard of that. It was developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center in Sweden. 
and its attempt at defining what they call a safe operating range for humans based on the planet's capacity. Um, the safe zone is this area in the middle, of the green segments. They've got nine segments all together, um, and they each define a, a, feed, a feedback loop. So down here, okay. And the bad news <laughs> is uh, climate change is only one of them. It's that one at the top. So of course, the, um, the science moves on. The, this was originally developed in 2015. They've had a couple of updates since then. Um, this is the latest one. And it's saying that seven of these sectors, sorry, just over half of these sectors, we're already over the boundary and, and way over in some cases. That implies some of this damage is already irreversible or will be very expensive to, to reverse. And we're actually close to the boundary on ocean acidification. Of course, the role of transport in all of this, that's the top curve, um, is both sign significant and increasing. We're, we're behind the curve with everybody else. We're dragging our heels. So business as usual is not an option. And the other thing is that major infrastructure and significant changes in travel behavior, they usually take at least a generation to come into effect. And it hasn't, what hasn't helped is to date, we've had really just two planning paradigms predict and provide, and demand management. I would have thought by now it's self-evident that predict and provide is never going to work because the only parallel that we have in nature is cancer, and we all know where that goes. Um, and since it's really just extrapolation for past behavior, we know for sure, we don't need to do any forecasting, we know for sure it's going to fail. It's going to take us across the boundaries. Demand management is very much the same, and all you're doing is pushing the curve down, the orange curve, you're still going to go over the boundary, it's just going to take you a little longer to do it, to get there. And it's been, it's been around since the, since the 90s, and in that time, global electricity demand has actually tripled. So it really hasn't been working. Um, the other problem is it can also cause um, animosity, resistance from the public, because they see it as a, an attempt to restrict their freedom. We've seen a lot of this on social media recently. The resilience model actually turns everything on its head. And it says, we take our natural limits from the planetary boundaries model and we use that as a design specification. And that forces us to change direction. <laughs> forces us to change direction. We actually free up space to, for, for genuine innovation, for more ideas. So just a very simple analogy. We've got a bath here and it's overflowing. You can just about see that in the picture. Um, if we don't change our perspective, we're just going to keep on repeating the same mistakes. So the predict and provide response is just you get a bigger bath. But the trouble is that it's going to fill up. <laughs> it's just going to take a bit longer. So then we think, OK, let's, um, let's increase the size of the overflows. That doesn't have any effect. Let's, let's increase the size of the outflow pipes. And again, we just get a little more time. We're sitting back to square one. So suddenly someone has a brain wave. And they say, well, why don't we just turn the tap down a little bit? That's demand management. So you get four million tweets on, on, on the Twitter sphere saying this is genius or whatever. Um, but the problem is the bar still overflows. It's just going to take a bit longer again. We, we're just not solving the problem. You get the, the, the next phase would be the disruptors come along. Uh, and they say, well, let's change the material. Let's, let's make it something that can expand so we can increase the capacity. So rubber, or maybe you know, a space age nanotechnology, uh, carbon reinforced ceramic plastic or something. The trouble is, it's then no, no longer usable as a bath. So what might be the resilience approach? It's actually very simple. You just put in a shower instead. And the thing about the shower is it's more space efficient, more resource efficient, but it's actually designed to use overflowing water. So that is the, the, the whole essence of resilience based planning. So another very simple uh, analogy, just to get us to think about this a bit more. Um, we revised our growth paradigm. We now have to think about the way we treat time, particularly in appraisals. So here we have um, the history of the planet, about 4 billion years. We're going to compress it into a day, OK, 24 hours. So. We turn up, five in the morning is the first um, organisms, the first life forms in the seas. So they're fairly early risers. 
we've got a, got a fairly long wait until just before 10 in the evening for the first land animals. And then our ancestors, the first hominids, about two million years ago, they're actually turning up about, come on, my clock's stuck. <laughs> there we go. Just before midnight. <laughs> Um, the Hallocene, and that's the period since the last Ice Age, about 12,000 years ago, that's when all agriculture, all civilization came into being. Okay? We're one second to midnight. And the Hallocene, well, sorry, the Anthropocene, which is what um, scientists are calling the age of, the, of climate change, is less than the blink of an eye, less than the time it took me to press that button. So next time you hear anybody talking about the long term, just remember to blink first. Okay, we're thinking along more manageable timescales now. At the very least, we need to consider the full life cycle of our, of our assets. So that's really from a systemic, a systemic point of view, systemic efficiency. Our aim really is to reduce waste at all stages, not just in, in terms of materials, but also energy. Okay? So for infrastructure and other physical assets, we can address this through techniques such as uh, whole life costing. And BIM is, come on. <laughs> BIM is, is well suited to support that. The trouble is BIM is only being used for some new projects, not all, and very few at all existing assets. So it's, its usefulness will increase in time, but we're not there yet. We also need to reduce our reliance on, on overly abstract models to take account of what I would call the messiness of reality because we're, not, we're never starting with an entirely blank sheet. So we need to think about place, location, and in particular, the real places behind the maps and the numbers and all the, <laughs> so, all the high level uh, models. Sorry, my animations are going a bit haywire. Okay, so we also need to be realistic about what, what can be achieved and by when. We need to take account of political, social, financial constraints. And the worst that we can do is to invest heavily, which we are doing now, in technologies that will not only fail to meet current challenges, but could actually undermine or jeopardize the technologies we need to adapt now uh, for the future. So this implies the need for us to, um, to plan for the future in a different way. Things like 10-year plans, five-year plans, they work under a business-as-usual paradigm, but we're not there now. We're in a new world. Um, and in a resilience framework, what we basically need to do is think big, but start small and act fast. And this really is the essence of agile. So we need to plan in an agile way. So we'll move on to appraisal now. That's the business case and how we, we get funding and backing for our projects. Again, we need to adjust our worldview first. So let's be clear on this. Of all the living entities on this planet, we are the only ones. <laughs> it's like a rebound effect. Okay. We're the only ones that are net consumers of energy and resources. We, at the planetary level, we take and we don't give much back. So similarly, well, while natural assets actually increase in value over time, biospheres, biotopes increase over value, and Costa Rica knows, understands this very well, um, infrastructure assets tend to depreciate over time. So when we try and equate the two using monetary estimates, we, we're biasing our analysis from the, from the start. Hello, who's gone? Oh, there he goes. So from a resilience perspective, our starting point should always be to make best use of precious resources. So we start at the top, and reduce here include, includes cutting down on waste. Recycling, which is f for, for years has been considered to be the holy grail, is actually quite low down because it actually suggests we're, we're missing something at the design stage. We should be, at the very least, designing for reuse. So how does this translate into transport and, uh, and infrastructure? This is um, some guidance from New Zealand. New Zealand is in many respects very similar to Costa Rica. Um, 
they start from the bottom with integrated planning. The second step I would take issue with, I, they call it demand management, they actually mean waste reduction. Then best use of existing network. And only when those have failed and they, they, they're sure that new infrastructure can deliver um, beneficial impacts at systemic level, will they progress to that level? It's almost the reverse of where we are at the moment. So how do we measure systemic impact? Increasingly, we're seeing appraisal network uh, frameworks that purport to address what's called the triangle of sustainability. That's um, society, economy, and the environment. But in practice, what happens is this. Okay. And the reason is because dollars are used as a proxy for prosperity. Of course, we forget that money is just a unit of transaction. You can't eat it. You can't drink it. So one of the main problems with our method evaluation is it doesn't distinguish between wants and needs. Our needs are fairly simple. We need health. We need to feel healthy. We need to feel safe, secure. We need to be stimulated mentally, uh, culturally. And we need to interact in, in, in some way. We need to engage. Now, prosperity is actually much more complex than just monetary value, and it includes things like well-being. And that's clearly linked to the quality of the environment in which we live, we work, we relax. It, it, could, it should never be measured purely in monetary terms. It can't be measured purely in monetary terms. And it derives from the value that we attach to place, local communities, homes, workplaces, shops, uh, hospitals, and from the flow of goods and services, the flow of values between those places. Okay? And that's where obviously where transport comes in in the widest sense. So our job actually is to balance those demands for transferring value between locations with the need to preserve and ideally enhance the places that are served. So my notes are disappearing, okay. So there's something missing basically from the triangle of sustainability and that, that's place. It's the role of local geographical and cultural differences. So a simple example would be for the, the variation in local species of, well, tortoises here in this case, that inspired Darwin to develop the theory of evolution. But what about designed objects? Okay, well, we come from abroad, most of us, we're all gonna be familiar with this. Why are there so many different power sockets? Why? The answer is because, okay? And even worse, because it's a new technology, why are there so many different charging plugs? You know, it's a new, we've only just adopted this and, and already we've got a plethora of different, and of course Tesla's different from everyone else. So sadly, these things are a fact of life. Our models just have to, have to cope, they have to deal with them. It's another simple illustration. If we plot GDP per capita on the bottom axis and the use of private cars on, on the horizontal, the vertical axis, we can infer some sort of general patterns about um, urban form and density. And we see that higher density cities, cities like Tokyo and Hong Kong on this bottom curve, they're far less reliant on private car use, around about 20% mode share. But that's not the whole picture. The cities lying on the lower curves typically developed long before cars were around, and they tended to grow organically. Many at the top, particularly in, in the, what we call the new world, um, they're based on a grid. They're grid-based cities, and they developed in tandem with car use. We know that grid-based cities are inherently inefficient for public transport. So the interesting thing, though, is that the cities that are most car reliant are not the ones with the highest level of GDP per capita. It tends to be these ones down the bottom, Europe and parts of Asia. But even in America, which is like supercar culture, you can see at the top, uh, the, the most affluent parts are less reliant on car. So here we've just updated the triangle of sustainability. It's now four poles, and of course, to deliver solutions that, are, that meet global and local needs, we've got to balance across all of them. Okay. Oh, <laughs> went a bit quick there. Um, so I want to reflect briefly now on how we measure efficiency. 
typically, again, it's defined in very narrow terms. So you, you're probably familiar with infographics like this. They're quite widely available now. But again, they don't tell the full picture. They, they're kind of missing some, some aspects of reality, shall we say. We've got to go back to the planetary boundaries model to check the main systemic impacts. So in this graph here, we've got a measure of planetary efficiency. It's called the global footprint. So basically, how many planets do we need? <laughs> okay, the, the, the answer should be one, obviously, but it's not, <laughs> unfortunately. And on the vertical axis, we've got a kind of quality of life index, so, uh, sustainable development goals. And so we're obviously trying to get towards the 100. So the ones that actually seem to perform best, um, okay, we've got a couple of anomalies here. I think the green one is probably Qatar, um, and the yellow one is in Europe, so I'm guessing it's probably Liechtenstein or Luxembourg. <laughs> um, but actually, the ones that, that most people are trying to emulate, the USA, again, yeah, they're, they're, oh, come on. They're not doing too badly in terms of quality of life. They're not the best, but look at where they are. Five planets, six planets, come on, be serious. <laughs> You've got to change, guys. What we need to be doing is going in this direction, towards the top left corner. And actually countries like um, Costa Rica, which in this cluster here, are pretty well positioned to do this. They're very close to the one, and all they need to do is push that back a bit with efficiency savings, develop this way. That would be world leaders. So just thinking about urban areas, and uh, despite COVID, the global trend is towards more urbanization. We need to take account of space efficiency, obviously. So again, you're probably familiar with these kind of infographics with just saying car in towns, in town centers, is not efficient. It's not space efficient. Um, and let's remember that very early production cars like the Model T Ford were actually designed for farmers, not for people who lived in cities. But the other aspect is they're not just consuming space on the streets in traffic, but they're also obviously taking up a lot of valuable real estate, parked, <laughs> and if I get back to that one, okay, this is in North America, but it can be 95% of the time, they're just sitting around doing nothing. Well, they're depreciating, obviously, but they're doing nothing else, wasting a lot of land. Okay, so um, there's another worrying trend. I know we use the term a lot, um, mobility, but to me it's, it's becoming a bit of a marketing term. I think the focus of transport is actually on providing access, access to goods, to services, meeting basic needs. Okay? Uh, if we continue to emphasize movement, then we're actually going to continue to deliver infrastructure that's not only inefficient but also unnecessary. So there really was a scheme to stick a motorway through the middle of London back in the 50s, 60s. It would have wiped out hundreds of years of capital um, of social and, and uh, built environment capital, and really just for a promise of some imaginary time savings for car, for car trips that weren't actually necessary. Why would you drive through the middle of the city of London? Why? You know, you're missing the, completely missing the point. But even if we take standard guidance, such as the Highway Capacity Manual, okay, so you see a typical traffic flow profile here, the white blocks on the graph, the black, this is level of service A or B. The black is wasted. <laughs> it's like, it's not used. So why are we designing that capacity? Okay, forget it, forget level of, it, level of service A, for sure. But even if you go to level of service D, you're still wasting nearly 50% of the asset across a day. Okay, just moving on to this idea that technology and innovation or the market's gonna save the day, it's not. There's no magic wand. Why? There's actually a num quite a number of reasons. It. Firstly, uh, one reason is that mu much of what is marketed as being novel is actually quite a an old idea. You know? um, this one is an example from London. I used to live right next to this. It's right in the middle of this, the financial district. And the picture at the top is actually from a 1963 government report in the UK called Traffic in Towns, or the Buchanan Report. And it was a time when there was a lot of bomb damage in, in big cities in Europe, and they were talking about reconstruction. This was called traffic architecture. It kind of developed in Scandinavia. and was considered to be quite futuristic, but it was a design for nothing. It's just an illustration in a book. Below is what actually exists there now, and 
the joke is as well that the peak hour traffic on this road isn't much higher than that, but it's still got four lanes, and the pedestrians are pushed onto these high walks, which are very expensive to build and maintain, and are increasingly being removed. The thing is, the Buchanan report actually came up with some very good ideas, particularly environmental management areas, and we'll talk about them a bit later. But they weren't adopted in the UK. It took countries like Germany and some of the Scandinavian countries to pick it up. Okay, this one is one of my favorites. I to, you've got to try and guess the cities, okay? So the, the bottom left is Riyadh. Obviously, I deliberately chose them because they look the same. The top right is Dubai. And the bottom right? It's actually, it's from a film from America, a promotional film, obviously promoting cars, but how old is it? 1930, okay? So these cities that build themselves as being futuristic, sort of beacons of innovation, they're, they're using a blueprint that was drawn up by their great-grandfathers or even their fathers. It's not really very inspiring. And this is kind of the natural extension of that, that way of thinking. <clears throat> It's predict and provide, essentially. The wrong response, the wrong place, the wrong time. And uh, the thing is, once it's built, it's there. It's very hard to get rid of. OK, another reason that technology often fails to deliver is basically hype. Uh, marketeers over-promising, suppliers under-delivering. And in some cases, just the inability for the benefits to be scaled up. I think e-scooters is a very good example of that. The, the, the benefits don't scale if you take a, just forgetting the fact that it's competing with active travel. So sometimes this is intentional. We all know about built-in obsolescence, about having a new smartphone model every year. Do we really need one? No. Um, and what about things like um, software developers getting the public to test, beta test their software by giving us updates every week? The third reason is called Jevons' paradox, after this guy, a Victorian uh, economist and statistician. And basically says the, the more efficient we make something, the more we consume of it. Surprise, surprise. And so many of the imagined efficiency savings evaporate. It's called the rebound effect. So for example, we make cars safer, and people take more risks. We make them more fuel efficient, they drive them faster, they drive them further, and they do both. <laughs> so here's the first production motor vehicle and <laughs> laugh. It's, um, it's kind of a, a horseless carriage, basically, with an engine strapped on the back. Um, produced by Bentz in Germany in the 1860s. Here's the, here's the largest, I think I got the scale right, okay? This is the largest SUV in production now. And I don't think I'm exaggerating. They are hideously large, these things. Have you ever seen them? And even the humble Mini, which I grew up with, <laughs> which I grew up with in the 60s in London, um, designed to be as compact as technology allowed at the time. This is the Mini now. Uh, it has nothing in common. It's been on steroids or something, and it's completely forgotten the original design concept, you know? It's just a brand now. It's just a, it's just a badge. It means nothing. I think that's probably bigger than a Ford Transit used to be, actually. If you... Okay, so um, not only have cars become much, much larger, but the, so is the amount of road space they consume. So this is a graph of France, um, just to change the country. Um, it's average distance traveled per person per day over the last 200 years. So you've got kilometers up on the left-hand scale. And the thing is to notice how much it's kind of mushroomed since the post-war consumer boom. And that's, that's almost all car, voiture, car, and a little bit of air at the top. But it's, Basically, in 100 years, it's gone up tenfold. And it's not because that travel's all needed. It's because it's possible, OK? So again, we've got this, this contradiction between needs and wants. And this is reflected very clearly in the forms of our cities. This, there's a clear and obvious link between the urban form and the dominant travel modes. But it's not a one-way link. It's a two-way link, as, as <laughs> Min's shown with his models. Um, but it's not always reversible. And, and many cities that actually took out their trams and their trolley buses in the last century, they're now struggling to get them back in because <laughs> it's a lot harder to do. And finally, there's the fact that physical infrastructure takes a long time to plan and to deliver. So typically, the more, introvert, uh, sorry, the more innovative or controversial, the longer it takes. 
But jobs and people move around very quickly. Okay? Um, and actually, one of the growing problems that we're having is that by the time we respond to a particular set of social trends, they've, they've changed. <laughs> so again, we need an agile approach to planning. So we've seen one of the reasons that we often seem, go back, to make um, matters worse is that we keep extrapolating from the past. That's not just through incremental refinement um, or, or repackaging of old ideas, but increasingly this practice of what's called scenario planning. It, it's gone and sleep again. There we go. You come back. There we go. <laughs> Um, the practice of scenario planning, which is really just second-guessing the future based on, I don't know, the sci-fi of our childhood or films or modern marketing hype. I don't know what. But it has no bearing on reality. The far more productive approach is actually to specify where we want to get to based in resilience terms and work backwards from that to where we are now. The challenge, the innovation challenge, is to find the transition paths. So this is where the RAS model comes in. He's going to sleep. <laughs> doesn't want to change. There we go. But he's gone all at once. Okay. There we go. So instead of trying to second guess the future, the one thing we could be sure of is we're always, always going to be wrong. We need to start from the, the desired outcomes and work back from those to the baseline. So the focus of our innovation and creativity, creativity then shifts to, as I say, devising the, the options to test, uh, making sure they're inherently resilient, and then we basically build this decision tree, but we build it backwards. The three main components are the scenarios, the tree, the decision points, the triggers, and the pathways, which is the, the funding or the resource flows through the tree. And the thing is that it, because it's interactive, because it's adaptive, these flows change over time, and we can, we can add and remove scenarios. The, this feedback can be through things like smart sensors, but it can be through crowd, crowdsourcing as well. It really should be through crowdsourcing, uh, at the very least, because this not allows us to track progress and to shift the, the plan over time. It also engages the local communities, gives them buy-in and ownership, and they help, it helps them to learn. So the RAS model has a, a sort of toolkit, which I developed in Australia with Becca, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, which the, the, the main thing to note is it just covers all of the, all the professions, basically. It, it cuts across them all. Okay, so the things that the, the model is, is designed to, to deal with is obviously it's got to respect natural limits. It's got to include a life cycle perspective. It needs to be adaptive. It needs to work at multiple scales. The spoiler alert is that your outcomes should never look like this. So we start basically with a design specification or charter, which is a set of design factors that fit with the planetary boundaries model. So this is an example I took from ILFI's Living Community Challenge and adapted it to fitting with planetary boundaries. Uh, there are 16 of these all together, and they're all relatively simple, like that one because the idea is to stimulate innovation, not suppress it. This specification basically becomes the right-hand side of the tree. We then baseline our model uh, by identifying and prioritizing the issues that are relevant to our study area. So Sankey diagrams are a very good way of doing that. This is one for Canada. And the way you read them is from left to right, and they both add up to 100%. So this is actually energy, the energy market in Canada. You can see straight away that the majority of all of their energy is produced by fossil fuels, that transport is the biggest consumer, and most worrying of all, that's nearly 60% of the energy they produce is wasted, it's rejected, it doesn't even get used. So very clearly, in this one diagram, you can see where your priorities are. You then basically localize the planetary boundaries model because it's this big global thing, <laughs> you know. Um, to reflect the potentials, the constraints of your study area, and to get suitable metrics and target values or quotas. So, for example, this one is for biodiversity. We know the mechanisms. They're very well researched in the literature. 
you come up with suitable local targets for each of these. And then you can combine those with broader social um, objectives, such as um, sustainable development goals. But from the last count, there are about 200 odd of them, which is way too many. Um, so you need to filter them, of course. <laughs> it's like nobody wants 200 goals or, or, or KPIs. So next, we begin to sift the candidate technologies for inclusion in the scenarios. And many we can discount pretty quickly once we adopt this ba planetary boundaries perspective. So we can just build a simple, um, this is a bit oversimplified, but just a simple uh, multi-criteria analysis. You can see immediately, do we really need supersonic aircraft? Do we really need reusable space rockets? Certainly Costa Rica doesn't. We can also draw upon generic templates like this one. So say we've got a settlement, we know the, the population is never going to exceed half a million because we checked, we've done calculations about the natural bearing capacity. We didn't just extrapolate from the past. And clearly, you're not going to get high-speed rail or, or metro to work at that level. But if you go to, say, 2 million, which is San Jose, sort of greater urban area, you can start to look at LRT or maybe BRT, given the gradients. So you don't need to do lots and lots of feasibility studies. It's not rocket science. So of course, uh, we still need to make a business case of some sort, but it doesn't, it doesn't need to be too detailed, not a, not, a, not a start. What we're looking for is candidates that will go through this model, the decision tree, and get selected later on. So the first one is localization we talked about. The second one is the systemic efficiency test. And this is where we use something like the height filter. The, the thing is to notice that we've got to include everything that's feasible. And don't forget, broadband is a form of transport. Okay? In this case, we've gone for transit. When we get to the stage three, we're still only using multi-criteria analysis, basically. That's good enough at this stage. Here, we're just looking at subsets of a, of a given technology. So here, we've got light rail, heavy rail, bus. We're going with light rail. And then we go down to the scheme level, and we're looking at subsets of that technology. We've chosen trackless, ART, from China. Um, only then, it, this is the only point we start to use cost-benefit analysis. When we do use cost-benefit analysis, it needs to be um, using whole life costs, okay? not, not current market prices. And it needs to be using an appraisal, uh, a forecasting year, that fits the life cycle, not sort of 10, 20, 30. It's not an arbitrary year. Okay, so this is uh, essentially the, the, the schema for, for, for building this is software module. And there is an outer loop because you should review your outcomes at all times because the technology changes, communities change, there should be dynamic feedback so that it's not a static plan. So this is um, the design model uh, that sits under it. It's basically following the development life cycle. And it has an agile loop in the middle where you prototype and assess before you actually build, you actually commit to build. And then th there's a post-implementation review. And all this information gets fed back into BIM and allows us then to go forward to the end of the development life cycle. Is it disposed of? Is it re repurposed? Is it just upgraded? And then you just go through the loop again. So hopefully I've convinced you by now that our role is not simply to optimize traffic flows. Um, indeed, road hierarchy itself um, starts to become very questionable. By definition, a transport link needs to vary in its nature according to not just its role in, in, in supporting flows, but what's around it, what the land uses are on either side. Now, this is called the link place or movement and place model. It came from the UK originally, but in, in, in Australia, it's called movement and place. The failure to understand this principle leads to this kind of thinking, which again is like, essentially, it's, it's a set of links uh, without places. It's just, a, it's just a load of car parts um, joined up by completely over-specified roads. There is no city as such. So this dual function of transport links and, set, and, and connectivity and its setting um, applies to both new and existing infrastructure, primarily, primarily to streets, which is obviously the, the dominant type of uh, infrastructure in cities. 
and towns. But in short, um, when we're designing a transport corridor, we've got to think about a lot more than just road geometry and levels of service. Okay, these things come from uh, basically Gale architects, and if you know them, Gale's a very famous um, urban design practice from uh, Denmark originally and then moved to, to America. And then we also need to get the basics right though. So um, this is shopping center in London. You know, uh, who's got the traffic priority here? It's, it's completely wrong. Okay, so I'm just gonna have um, two concrete examples of what I would call world-leading urban retrofit schemes um, that kind of exemplify this approach. They're, they're gonna get you some way along the planetary boundaries route, but obviously not the whole way. Nobody's there yet. So this one is in Vienna. <clears throat> it's called Maria Hilferstrasse. It used to be just a standard shopping street, basically. It's the main shopping street, um, but it was just like any other shopping street. Um, this is what it looks like now. And it's a destination in effect. And uh, <laughs> okay, it took them about six years. It didn't take them that long. And there was obviously a lot of resistance at first from the shopkeepers, but actually there's been a net increase in prosperity. Everybody's a winner. Other one is, probably well known to you, um, it's the Super Elias in Barcelona. So they had this big grid-based system. And what they've actually done is taken Buchanan back from the 60s and used stuff like fused grids um, to actually make it work for more than just cars. Okay. But equally, they've used tactical urbanism, what's called tactical urbanism, or, or, or urban labs, as it's called in some places, to engage the, the community, the local community, in helping to shape this place. And the thing is that a lot of these measures they put in are temporary at first, so they can be taken out. If they don't work, they can take them out. It's no, it's no big deal. But they have been extremely successful. So what might this look like at the town or city level? This is research that I did at Cambridge. I call it Buchanan II. And it's basically taking the idea of an environmental management area and expanding it to the whole city or even to the whole region. And a few cities have gone sort of part of the way there, like London with the congestion charge zone and the zero emission zone, Oxford City, uh, even Bordeaux in, in France have gone somewhere along this route, but nobody's actually so far had the courage to do it everywhere. Okay, so hopefully I've managed to stimulate your thoughts, um, encourage you to reflect a bit, refocus, maybe challenge a few basic assumptions. I think above all, to be braver, to be more imaginative, and certainly more collaborative in developing your own responses to the resilience challenge. None of us are gonna meet this challenge alone, for sure. And I'd just like to end with a quote from one of the UN Sustainable Development Leads, uh, Achim Steiner. Basically, he said, governments need to make sure that technology contributes in a way that helps solve sustainability problems and not amplify them. And I'm sorry, but a lot of new technology is doing just that. Um, I'd amend this sentiment slightly because I don't think it's just the responsibility of governments. It's the responsibility of, of all of us, and particularly of those, those of us who are engaged in the built environment professions. Thank you. Tenemos varias consultas que se ha hecho a través de la plataforma Slide, donde también ustedes pueden hacerlas. Eh, hay cuatro consultas. La primera de ellas es la siguiente. ¿Cuáles son los... ¿Puede ampliar sobre el concepto de micromovilidad? Ah, oh, right, ok. Um, it's actually one of my pet subjects. <laughs> Uh, to me, micromobility is actually an, an admission that you got your urban planning wrong. Um, it's linked to this idea of first mile, last mile connectivity. Oh, this one. No, I, is this right? No? Yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry. You can hear, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically it's saying that we got our densities wrong, that we've got too much sprawl, uh, and that we're trying to use technology to, to, to a sort of sticking plaster to make this work, where actually we need to change the density balance. It's called uh, polycentric development. And um, it, certainly in, in the UK recently, there's been a lot of debate about the 15 or 20 minute city, which actually came from uh, Australia. Um, but again, they're all kind of tackling the problem the wrong way. 
So, so to me, micromobility is, first of all, not addressing the underlying problem. Secondly, there's a very real risk that it undermines active travel, which is actually much more beneficial for everybody. La siguiente consulta dice así, ¿qué importancia tiene una política pública articulada de infraestructura y transporte de largo plazo para obtener verdaderos resultados de resiliencia? Yeah, that's a very good question, exactly. The policy needs to follow the planetary boundaries framework because that is a common set of objectives that everybody can understand and share, and it's backed by science. How you adapt that to the local circumstances, the local culture, that's where the politics comes in. And the policies need to support that. One of the issues is, in many countries, is that there's been so much uh, power handed back to the private sector, it's actually difficult for policy makers to address all of these issues in an integrated way. So the, the cities that have really done well, like Vienna, um, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Singapore, have very special um, policies and legislation about how they control land use. And they, the way they assemble land use is largely still within the control of policymakers, not the private sector. That has a huge impact. If you can't control that, then you're always going to be in reactive mode, to some extent. Unless you can bring the private sector on board, of course. <laughs> ¿Qué tan efectivos son los autos eléctricos como medio de transporte y cuáles son los retos de dicha tecnología? Okay, to me, electric vehicles are um, a short-term uh, solution because they're taking away pollution from city centers. Depending on how you generate the power for the electricity that that, that charges the vehicles, that determines on how clean they are in, in, in overall terms. But the other issue is they're cars, they're still cars, and so we go back to space efficiency. Cars in town centers are not as efficient as public transport, and they're not as good or beneficial as active travel, as walking and cycling. Um, the other thing is they have secondary side effects. For example, they're very dependent on lithium, for example, which is a rare earth material. And so you, you have to go back to the planetary boundaries to see what the full impacts are before you can actually answer these kind of questions. At the, at the, at the moment, we rely too much on the marketing guys to tell us, and we don't have enough real information ourselves to make these decisions. But to me, it's a short-term solution. It's, it's good, but it, it doesn't solve everything. Okay. Esta es la última consulta. Eh, por favor, ampliar o la consulta la siguiente, ampliar las carreteras ayuda a aumentar la fluidez del tráfico y a reducir los tiempos de viaje, la infraestructura de la vía. <laughs> yeah, in the short term. <laughs> But then they fell up like the bath, okay? Um, no, and the, the issue is the solution varies according to place. In a town center, you don't want big wide roads because they undermine everything else. The, the, point, the purpose of the road is two. One is to carry traffic, the other is to serve the land uses on either side of it. If you concentrate on just flow, you end up with Dubai, which is just all these great separated junctions and car parks. There's no real city. They killed the city. Mm -hmm.